I think we are live. Hello there and welcome to Mission Unstoppable. I'm your host Frankie Picasso as always and it's so great to have you join us today. Very special show for us. I have with me the very handsome Gary Pope Sr. He is a businessman, a CEO, a business consultant, university professor, author who is passionate about entrepreneurs, why they succeed and why they fail. His first book, Why Entrepreneurs Fail, to Win is widely used as a textbook in college and entrepreneurship programs. And this past Monday, he just launched his latest book, Why Black and Brown Entrepreneurs Fail to Win, which is intended for entrepreneurs and those who want to be. You know, while many principles are the same for all entrepreneurs, uh, Mr. Polk cites the challenges that differ for our black and brown brethren. So Gary Polk is active in numerous organizations. He was recently selected by the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, uh, the NFTE, as their 2020 National Individual Volunteer of the Year. Congratulations on that, Gary. Thank you. And on January the 15th, 2021, Gary is going to be launching his Polk Institute of Social Entrepreneurship. It seems that we both were a proponent of social entrepreneurs. As you know, yeah. Frankie's all about social impact. The address for that is https colon slash slash poke hyphen ise dot org. And you can go back there and look at that later. Focus on the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. Gary believes that when the triple B aligns, it drives success for everyone. How are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Doing awesome. Great. Awesome. Well, it's really, really a pleasure to have you here. I love the topic of entrepreneurs. I love entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur. I especially love social impact. So I want to get and talk about all of that. But this, this book that you just recently launched on Monday is all about black and brown entrepreneurs and, and how, why, you know, on surface they seem to fail, but they don't really. Um, but you, you have resources and, and, you know, advice for them specifically that differs from, you know, other entrepreneurs, even though, you know, it, the advice is the same, where they can go and how they can get some help it is does differ. So let's talk a little bit about what, what is it that you love about being an entrepreneur, about teaching entrepreneurship? Let's start there. Okay. Well, that's a great question. Um, 1991, I started teaching at the university level and I was doing some volunteer work at Cal State Northridge where I was the chairman of the advisory board for the College of Business. And the, uh, the dean asked me to teach a class. And I said, wow, I never thought about that. He said, well, you're qualified, you have a master's, we see you work with our students, you're great with students, so we think you'll do a great job. I said, okay, thank you. And I said, I wonder how can I establish myself as a university professor? And then I remembered I was a banker read many, many business plans. So I would teach my students how to write a business plan. Because I was a banker, I would teach them that part C financial is the most important part of any business plan. Because I told them if the numbers don't work, the business doesn't work. You can have great management, great marketing ideas, but you got to come down to the numbers. And I said, so I'm going to show you how to come up with how much money it takes to launch your business. You pick any business you want how you're gonna spend the money, and then how you're gonna pay it back, and how you're gonna have collateral. We'll go through the whole process, but instead of you presenting to your classmates, I'm gonna bring in my banker friends and my CPA friends, and they will form a loan committee, and you'll be presenting your deal to them. Wow. And I said, Bank, and we call it a deal. So that kind of up the uh, ante, if you will. For sure. And it worked. Yeah. The students loved it. My colleagues, when I brought them in, they loved it. And we did it over and over. So just to show you how things evolve, today I teach the same class at Cal State Dominguez Hills, but now it's called Entrepreneurship for Everyone. Business 100, so a freshman level basic GE course, but because it's Entrepreneurship for Everyone, where we are today, a lot of people are interested. It's not intro to business, that sounds a little bland, blah, blah, intro to business but we stay entrepreneurship for everyone. But I can't take credit for the title, it's called Pleasurism. I found a book that was printed in the UK called Entrepreneurship for Everyone. I said, wow, what a great name for my class. So I actually used that book and kept that title. I didn't like the book once I got into it, so I got rid of the book, <laughs> started using open source learning, but I kept the title. Yeah. So awesome. now we're about in the fifth year of teaching this class at Dominguez Hills. I teach two sections every semester, and I have biology majors, 
sociology majors, communication majors, psychology, all these non-business majors, actually more non-business majors take it than business majors. And then we have people who are seniors or juniors taking a freshman level course. So already my class is out there for spring 2021, starts in January. One section is already filled. The other section, 33 out of 40 spots are filled. So the demand is there. I don't doubt that. And, and I'm sure it's a testament to you as a teacher, for sure. Well, the exciting thing is entrepreneurship is really what, is what capitalism is based on. So just go textbook on your professor a little bit. A guy named Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and it outlined capitalism. In America, we have really adopted this idea of entrepreneurship and capitalism. So in the United States, I know you're in Toronto, so I'm just saying United States. Other than the States. <laughs> so it's really the backbone to our economy. And when I teach with class, I'll ask, what do these entrepreneurs have in common? Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Wally Amos, Joy Mangano, uh, Ramona Banzuela. And what they have in common, they all started small. Every business starts small. You never start a million dollar business at a million dollars. Right. But you hope to grow to that. And it's a failure sport. And that's why I have to talk about failure. Yeah. Because it's like our baseball. No one hits 800. I'm a Dodger fan. We just paid Mookie Betts $400 million in a contract, and he still only hits 300. Wow. That means he gets three hits out of 10 at bats. That means he failed twice as much as he succeeded. But the nature of baseball is failure, and that's the nature of entrepreneurship, and that's why we have to talk about it. But at the same time, why do we do it? Because of financial freedom. Right. Because we don't want to work for someone else. And really, capitalism is about profit and not a paycheck. And then we took, put the spin of social entrepreneurship. Now we can say people, planet, and profit, and all three can coexist. So it's not a zero-sum game, and that's what's really important. Yeah, I think I that's think really I exciting. The question probably went overboard, but no, I like it. I like it. it. You know, it's it's a fascinating topic and in one that is really near and, and dear to my heart. And I love the, you know, it's, it's interesting. My, I, I've always been an entrepreneur and my, and my kids used to say, can't you go work for a company? Because like, then they can just give you a paycheck. Right. Mm. I, I was the first female kickboxing promoter in the world and, and I won the world championships and they go, wow. I mean, it was like, took nine months. I mean, enough time to have a baby and you're working night and day when you're an entrepreneur, you work for yourself. So, you know, the hours you're always putting in the hours and they go, can't, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, when I grow up, I'm not going to work for it. I'm going to go with somebody else and they're going to pay me. I go, but right. those people still have to get business. They think it's safer to go and work for a company, but they still have to go out and get the business too. Somebody has to go out and knock on doors, wherever so, you are. Somebody's got to do the job. I'd rather do it for me. I'd rather have no ceiling and somebody saying, this is all you're allowed to earn. Or what well, I put in is what I can get out. I like that. So it's interesting that you bring up the ceiling because in business management, we talk about the glass ceiling. And typically, it impacts women. Right. Because for whatever reason, you don't get to that old boy C-suite level. And a lot of women realize that and say, I don't have to be in that. I can start my own company. And I'm already in the C-suite. Exactly. So that's a very important thing to point out. But here's what happened with me. I was in my mid-30s at Bank of America in Beverly Hills. I was an assistant vice president. Behind me in the next row was a vice president who was 20 years older than me in his mid-50s, afraid to answer his telephone. <gasps> he was worried that Region was going to call him and give him his early out package. Oh, man. And so I'm starting to think, wow, you mean I work really hard here? I've been here 10 years. I work another 20, so 30 years, and now I'm afraid to answer the phone? Because he says, hey, Gary, they want guys like you. They want the young guys. They don't want those old guys. And I'm thinking, is that what I have to look forward to? And then when I started looking at my clients who live in Beverly Hills, who are not the entertainers or the actors or the rich people, they were entrepreneurs. Right. And I had this epiphany. I said, wait a minute. If I really want to do something, I need to work for a profit. I need to get out of banking. So I learned a ton. But I got out of bank, went into sales, and then went into entrepreneurship on my own. And that's kind of how we got started. But it really was the conversation of, do I want to get into my 50s? And then someone says, goodbye. Hey, did, you ever, 
I don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> Did you ever use the book, The Career Warranty Plan, in your, in, in your classes at all? Have you ever heard of that book? I have not heard of that book. That, that book, it, The Career Warranty Plan, was, was a book that was written by a guy who worked for, I think it was Toyota, one of the, one of the big, and all the big execs, you know, were up there. And mm -hmm. one day they went to the board meeting and they all sweeped, all got fired. And who yes. survived and who didn't? And the book was all right. about that and how come they survived and how come they, they didn't. Mm. All, you know, smart guys, all smart, whatever. And, and because somebody had planned and they could go into business for themselves where somebody else is still looking for a lateral move or looking. It's very interesting read. But, you know. What was the name of the title again? A Career Warranty Plan. Interesting. Yeah. Look that up. I so, I mean, you know, do you have, do people who work for other people have a plan? You know, what happens if you get sacked? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? I've, I mean, the first thing I do is go, go into business for yourself. Go into business for yourself. <laughs> yeah. It is my go-to. Um, now, one of the things that you, that you say um, in the book that I, I, thought I, I found it was interesting, emotionally based decisions rarely turn out good. But what about your gut decisions? Because I've always gone by my gut in business. Well, I think that that is a great point because when I say emotional, I'm not really talking about the gut. I'm talking about something non-business where it's really more subjective than business. It's really irrational. Maybe it's on a whim. Maybe um, you don't need it, but you want it. And there's no real rationale other than you just want it and you do it. Or it's Friday the 13th and you're afraid, so you're not going to do it that day. <laughs> and so as consumers, as individuals, we may do that and that is okay. Yeah. But as business people, we have to look at the bigger picture. We've got to slow it down a little bit. I used to be in corporate sales and I dealt with CFOs and C CEOs. And it wasn't the emotional sale like it was with a consumer. Oh, I want to buy this car because you look good in red. Oh, really? Okay, I'll buy the car because I look good in red could be the only basis of buying that car. Yeah. In business, you need to think about your return on investment. Mm -hmm. You need to think about something called opportunity cost. If I do this, I can't do that. Which one has a bigger return on investment? So I just say that to say that if you're too emotional, maybe you want to step back when you calm down. Maybe it's just it's a few hours. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a one day sleep on it and then make that decision because a lot of times, and in banking, they kind of taught us that if a borrower comes in and really are trying to force you to go fast to make this credit decision, the faster they push you, the slower you should go. Yeah. Because what are you going to miss in this speed? It's the speed is not your problem. It's really their problem. Now they're trying to make it your problem. Yeah. You can't buy into that. But again, we want to make balanced, well thought out decisions. Even that, we still can make bad decisions, but at least it's not oh, that emotional thing that I'm really sorry that, that I did. And sometimes our gut, like you mentioned, our gut is even a better indicator than our brain. Sometimes our brain can be saying, do this, do this, but the gut said, nah, you don't want to do that. And I'm sure all of us have made that brain decision or that heart decision when the gut said no and you regret it, not listening yeah. to your gut. Yeah. But, you know, that's the intuition part. You don't really teach intuition. Some people have great instinct, great intuition, and some people have none. You actually can't teach well. intuition, but I think it's, it's, you know, you just have to practice using it. And the more you see that you win when you do it, the more you can rely on it. I think that's kind yeah. of where, where it goes with that. Um, I, so in the book, <laughs> I, I had to laugh a little bit because you're talking about, you know, the white entrepreneurs with the, with the um, daddies who, you know, the billionaire daddies who, who have a trust funds. And I don't know anybody like that, but <laughs> they're, out there. they're out there. Of course they are. I a couple. Yeah. But you know, is, I don't think the line is that drawn that distinctly that all white okay. people have trust fund daddies and, and all black people don't. However, I mean, the principles are, are the same principles for business are the same. I mean, everybody has to do a business plan. Everybody's got to do, you know, whatever. So, what is it about black and brown entrepreneurs that you specifically are talking to them about? What is it that you want them to know that you know um, that they don't know? Well, you made a good point, And that's something I really want to make clear to all the readers is that in many, many ways, there are no differences. We are risk takers. We are problem solvers. We have to develop a team. We have to be a leader. 
In my opinion, we have to have high character, high ethics, and those are the basics. But there's two chapters. One is called Cultural Differences. And I think that in reality, I'm a black man, grew up in America. There is a difference between black and white. Mm -hmm. We just have to acknowledge, acknowledge that. Do we want to have a pity party because we're black? No. We want to recognize that. I took a class on diversity uh, when I was a coach at Dominguez Hills, and it was really interesting. It was done by the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association. And I thought, because I grew up black, I knew a lot about diversity, but I learned a few things. And one of the great things I learned, they talked about the difference between a salad bowl and a melting pot. In a melting pot, they call the United States a melting pot. Yes. But if you think about it, a melting pot, things go in and you lose your identity because you're part of that melting pot. So you're mixed in and you lose your identity. What they made the case was a salad bowl, you go in, lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, whatever you want. You mix it together, but you maintain your identity. Mm -hmm. Lettuce is still lettuce, but mixed with tomatoes and onions and cucumber, it tastes really good. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea is that you want to maintain your identity, but know that there are differences. But is that difference a negative or a positive? Really, that kind of depends on you. Mm -hmm. We know that there are people that see a glass, some will say, well, that glass is half empty. And others will say, that glass is half full. Right. So I think it's perspective. My book is really a book on empowerment. It's about, yes, we can. And I mentioned that a couple times. President Obama used, yes, we can a couple times. So I did, I, you know, I always, as a professor, we never want to plagiarize. So if we have another source, where's that source? I want to give that credit. But yes, we can, says we can do it in spite of whatever obstacles we have. So what I try to talk about, here's some culture differences. Let's acknowledge it and let's move on. The other big chapter that makes uh, black and brown different would be the issue of self-doubt. Mm -hmm. So we did some research and this self-doubt came up over and over. Young people, middle-aged people, baby boomers, self-doubt. And in the black and brown community, sometimes it's not the majority, sometimes it's our own people. But regardless of the source, it's there. And sometimes they call it the imposter syndrome. I'm doing something, but I'm really not that good and someone's gonna figure me out. Yeah. So that's part of self-doubt. It is, it's, it's part of failure. It's, it's a fear of failure of losing too. Exactly. Yeah. So I actually, I have some strong feelings about self-doubt and I think we all have dealt with self-doubt at some point. Absolutely. Some of us hold it, let us hold us back. And some of us say, okay, not me. I was a short basketball player. I'm 5'7". I told people I play basketball. They said, no, you don't. Yes, I do. But I didn't have the self-doubt that I couldn't play. I knew I could play. Now, when I got to college and guys were like a foot taller than me and as fast and as energetic, I realized I better stay with academics or education because <laughs> that was going to be my career. Yeah. But I never had the self-doubt that I couldn't play. Right. And I, that is the key to know that you can play. It is the key. It is the key. Yes. It totally is the key. If, you're, if you don't hear anything else in this show, guys, the key is I know that I can do it because I have gone for – you know, different jobs and different things. And, and my sister, well, I went to Cornell and I got my undergrad and my grad, my blah, 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 you know, and blah, blah, blah. How did you get that job and make that money? I go, because I could do it. I knew in my head I could do it. So it doesn't matter, you know, what degree you have. I mean, maybe it does someplace. But for me, it never mattered what degree I had. It mattered that I knew that I could sell it. I could do that. I could sell me doing that because I knew in my heart of hearts I could do it. That's and I think right. that's the key confidence it's not being arrogant, but it's being confident in your own abilities and what tools you bring to that toolbox with you and, and, and knowing that. And it really totally is the key. I mean, our brain, you know, is likened to um, uh, Maxwell Maltz and psycho cybernetics. He, he, he likens, you know, the brain to a servometer. And so if you've done it once, the brain goes, I, okay, we did that before, something similar. I, I can, you know, blah, 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 compute. We can now, we can do it again. And it's exactly how it works. 
you know, right. we, we can adapt and because we know how something works and, and it's absolutely amazing. So you knew that you could do it and you can do it and look at where you are. And that's exactly all people. I think all people really need, like, that's the key of anything. One of my managers and farmers, a guy I was very close with, he was actually a fraternity brother. He used to always say that you're six inches from success. And people would look at him and said, it's the space between your ears. Yeah. And we were in a sales environment. Some of our salespeople, our agents didn't do as well as others. And he always said, you're six inches from success. Because the idea is that if you think you can, or you think you cannot, you're probably right. Yeah. So if you think you cannot do something, well, you can't do it. But if you think you can, then all of a sudden that brain says, I can do it. And then we do amazing things. I mean, I have so many stories related to this. You ever heard of a guy named uh, Jim Ryan? I think yeah. it was Jim. No, no, Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister. Oh, Roger Bannister. They said no one could break the four-minute mile. It was humanly impossible. He broke the four-minute mile somewhere in the mid-50s. What was amazing about the story, the same year he broke it, 11 other people broke it. Once they realized that a human could do it, then guess what? That barrier of four minutes was no longer there. Again, it goes back to the power yeah. of the brain. Yeah. So I'm not a psychiatrist, but I do know that positive thinking is very, very powerful in what we think of ourselves because you're a leader, I'm a leader, and we have to exhibit our own self-confidence while others can follow us. Yeah. And again, we can do this. We will do this is the leadership speak. You never want to say, do you think I can do that, Frankie? I might ask you that on a job, and you might say, well, if you have to ask me that, Gary, you're not the person for us. You should be telling me how you can do it yeah. instead of do you think I can do it. Yeah. And so it's the same thing of our own self-belief. And so I want to deal with that in the book and put yeah. that to the side. And then we get into the other parts of the book is really for any entrepreneur. We talk about access to capital. We talk about the power of networking. We talk about ethical leadership. I introduce social entrepreneurship. So we have all these basics. And a lot of times, black and brown aren't even thinking about social entrepreneurship. They haven't been introduced to the power of networking. Access to capital is tough for everybody. I wanted to ask you about, about um, the networking. Because I was, I was wondering, do you think, is, do, do black and brown entrepreneurs expect to succeed with their own culture because they're black and brown? So do they say, I'm going to start a business and black people are going to buy from me because I'm black. Like, do they have that, that mindset or is it, I'm going to sell to the world or I'm going to sell, you know, like, I guess it might depend on the business. I mean, if you have a wig shop, maybe it's different, but like, do they expect their, their own to buy from them? I'm going to think that that is more generational. Oh, is it? I think if you look at our millennials and our Gen Z, because we're more in a multicultural, acceptable world, I think then we do think that others will buy from us. But there was a time where whites had to eat on this side and blacks had to eat on that side. Right. Or blacks could eat at that restaurant and whites ate at that restaurant. So we go back to 60s, 50s and beyond, that generation probably catered to their culture. I think today's business owners see okay. a bigger picture and I know some entrepreneurs that will open up a coffee shop and expect everybody to come. Right, right. And that's why I wonder, because, you know, when we talk specifically black and brown entrepreneurs, here are, here are the issues or the challenges for you. It kind of says, well, are you thinking diversely if you're still thinking I have these challenges? Well, so here's the deal. If we talk about business, and again, we think about scaling. Mm -hmm. Well. One of the things that I teach is something called a total addressable market. Total addressable market means how big is that potential market that I'm going to go after? And I always like to use the analogy, if I started a company and it was Gary's hats because I like to wear hats, and they say, well, who's your target market? I say, everybody with a head. But that's too broad. Yeah. And I have to narrow that target market. So I might say males, and then I might say males age 35 to 55 with a household income of 80,000 plus, with some college education, and married. Now I've really narrowed that target market, and we get into the holy grail of specificity. But if I say blacks, 
Now I've really reduced that market. So if I said LA County is my beachhead and we know there are about 10 million people, believe it or not, to live in LA County, if I don't restrict it to black, my beachhead might be 2 million people. But if I say black, now all of a sudden my beachhead, my number, my total addressable market might be 500,000. And again, in a business context, do I want to have a 500,000 or 500,000 prospect market or 2 million? Right. Do we want to have that bigger. So again, I think we can make a business case why we don't want to be very narrow, at least on the ethnic level. I right. think that would be a huge mistake. And if I was coaching someone today and they told me that, I'd say, well, you might want to rethink that. Especially if it's not a brick and mortar business. Yes. Yeah. But because what we want to think about is scaling. Yeah. And the way we scale, one way that we scale is have a business that has multiple markets. And if you start narrowing your market, so at the beginning, you may say, I'm going to focus on women only, but later I'm going to expand that to males. Right. So at the beginning, I might want to have what we call the low hanging fruit, the early success. And I might want to say women only because women marketing is different than males. Yeah. But as I grow, I got to think, oh, yeah, I do want to include male, but not at the very beginning. So there's a, some business issues that you have to deal with. But again, if you do it on racial lines only, you're limiting your success. And I said, so what, what I like to do, I'd like to do the Socratic approach. Yeah. Instead of trying to give all these answers, I just want to ask questions. Yeah. Do you want to limit your market? Right. And yeah. most people will say no. You know, I found really interesting um, that there are, are seven black billionaires in the United States. And, and I think a lot of inner city youth and, and kids, they think the only way to get rich is through sports or music. Right. And yet the number one, the, the largest billionaire, black billionaire, it was a businessman. Right. Was a venture capitalist, which right. I think is fascinating. Right. And again, it goes back to the mentality of, so you had this idea early on, I don't know where it came from, that you want to work for yourself. Right. My generation of baby boomers, a lot of us wanted the job for life, get the watch after 30 years, and they're done. Some of us wanted to be entrepreneurs. I think we look at Gen X, that next group, I think more wanted to be entrepreneurs. And then we look at millennials, more want to be entrepreneurs. Because like you said earlier when you were talking, if you're going to work 40 hours, 60 hours a week, why not work for Frankie? instead of IBM. Yeah. And that's the idea. You know, my sister worked in the US and she would be working seven days a week, having to put in, I don't even know how, like a hundred hours. And I go, why yeah. do you do that? And she goes, well, yeah. I'm expected. Like my company will get rid of me in a heartbeat and get somebody else that will do it. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. Go work for yourself. If you can put in that kind of time, go right. and work for yourself. Oh my goodness. That's insane to go and work for somebody and work like a dog and they, and they could care less because if you don't perform today, man, you're gone. That's right. And that kind of pressure. Wait, it's not see, worth it. I worked at the old B of A that was founded in San Francisco. It was a California based company. It actually started out as the bank of Italy. By oh this yeah. Little Italian guy named AP Giannini. And he founded the bank for the little person. And the little person that day was a common man. Because in that day, in the early 1900s, banks were for rich people. But I say that to say B of A, we had this loyalty that a B of A for life. And I remember when I came in, I was a teller, 78, I graduated, I go on a management training program, and I meet these people and say, I've been with this bank for 40 years and blah, blah, blah. Well, in the 80s, banking changed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those guys who have been around 30 years got kicked out. Corporate America changed, B of A was one of them, that went from very customer, uh, employee-centric to very company-centric. And then they started getting rid of those people that were so loyal. I worked with one guy named Bob, he was assistant manager. He would use his vacation time to make business development calls for the bank because wow. he felt his first obligation while he was working was to be in the branch. And then guess what? When his time came, they got rid of him. And so people start realizing they saw their parents go through this, maybe their grandparents. We should look out for number one, our family, for us above right. that company. 
Right. Was it your sister in the story who was working 100 hours? She put her company first. Right. But at some point, the company is going to put the company first. Right. So in reality, we should think what's best for our family. And then if it works out to be with this company, then I'm here. But if it doesn't, I should do what's best for my family. I mean, let's face it. Not everybody is an entrepreneur. Not everybody has that skill set or the desire or the risk taking or any of that. Not, it's not for everyone. Right. However, you know, I'm also a coach. And so the first thing I talk about are values. What do you value? Yes. And if your values are in alignment with the organization or the company that you're going to work for, you're going to be a happy camper, potentially. But mm -hmm. if, they, if they don't align, you're not going to be happy because you're always going to be fighting that inner nature going, I don't like how they do business. They're not, they're not nice people or they're, they're this or they're that. So, you know, values and knowing yourself, even as an entrepreneur, is still really good. You have to have values, have to have, you know, uh, boundaries. You have to know you and, and what you want to put up with and what you don't. And, and who, even as far as clients, I don't want everybody as a client, you know, or, or a customer. That's right. You don't want everybody, even though you think you might. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, you know, knowing you is number one and, and putting yourself number one in your family, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, it used to be, like you said, companies were loyal to you, not any longer. And, right. and so, you know, people go, oh, I'll put in that time and effort and they're going to reward me, but they don't. They don't. They don't. It's a sad situation, but they don't. And in the 90s, it was a lot of early retirement action, especially in the defense industry. So not only did I have the experience at B of A, and this was like 86, 87, I also saw friends and colleagues who were in their early 50s being kicked out of corporate America. Mm -hmm. And here's a challenge. Let's say you make 100000 a year, 150000 a year in your, in your mid-50s. How do you go find another job in that? making that money so a lot of industries are very narrow your industry yeah. is very narrow everyone knows everyone once you get in certain industries right right so let's say you can't get another job in that industry now you're going to be a trainee in your 50s making a hundred thousand a hundred and fifty thousand it doesn't work like that no and i have one friend and he was telling me gary you know i should probably do something on my own but they're going to have to kick me out and then two years later he says I thought they would kick me out, but I didn't know they would use two feet to kick me out. <laughs> oh, no. And I've got a girlfriend just today, you know, 60 years old, fell on the job. It was the company's fault. Hmm. She fell down. She hasn't been back to work for months. She's just, you know, had surgery on her back and blah, blah, blah. And the company was bought out by another company today. Hmm. She just found out yesterday that she has only to today to apply for the new company to keep oh. her job. But she's not at work because she's off on disability at the moment wow. so how are you going to get a job at 60 mm. the longer you're off you've already been off for months now you're going to be off longer another mm. company's why where are you going to go get a job and make that kind of money like you said exactly. close to possible i remember the author it was it was bob clayton who wrote that book the career warranty plan and there you go the career warranty plan <laughs> that's what you got to worry about how can you work for yourself what's your backup plan and you know what gary i even believe that even you and I, understanding entrepreneurship, um, and, and I kind of find that when you get to be a certain age in midlife and, and older, you kind of want to give back. Like that's, there's something there that you want to give back as well. But, but even, even still, forced retirement doesn't feel good. And when you go into retirement, you still need to figure out, what am I going to do when I retire? Because I right. probably still want to make some money. Because, right. you know, social insurance, that's not going to cut it. Like social security, like what are you gonna get? Eight hundred bucks a month? Who's gonna live on that, right? Yeah. So, you know, you have to think about it. Now is your time to become an entrepreneur when you retire. Then, like, what are you gonna do with your life? What's well, interesting? COVID nineteen has a lot of people thinking entrepreneurial. Yeah, I teach a class uh, discipline entrepreneurship, twenty four steps to a successful startup, and I would say now maybe forty percent of people are saying, "I'm here." because of COVID-19, now I'm starting to think about my own business. Yeah. So that's kind of one of the pluses about COVID-19. It's been a lot of bad stuff. I don't know. Sure, sure has. Yeah, here too. Canada, but yeah. there's some positives too. Again, is that cup half empty or half full? And maybe COVID-19 is the opportunity to start looking around and maybe doing something for yourself. But like you said, it's not for everybody. And that's why we talk about the failure factor. Yeah. 
And I tell my clients, you could do everything I told you to do and you could still fail yeah. because that's the nature of business and there are no guarantees. Yeah, there's no guarantees. College basketball, I coach high school basketball. So I'm one of those who may be a little rare in that I've coached athletes and I've coached entrepreneurs and the similarities, both of them are alpha dogs mentality. Yeah. Both of them are in a sport that they can lose every time they play. Yeah. Why do they do it? And when you lose, do you say, well, I suck, I quit, I'm no good? Or do you say, no, here's what we did wrong, we weren't prepared, let's learn, let's get better, and then let's go do it. And so you have to have a certain amount of um, resilience and resourcefulness. Yeah. And it's really amazing. Those are the intangibles that cannot really be taught. Other parts of entrepreneurship can be taught. And that's another big thing I make. Entrepreneurship can be taught. The book I just referred to was written by a guy named Bill Allett, and he talks about there's really no entrepreneur DNA per se, but there's certain qualities that's going to help you. Yeah. There's a there's a movie called Joy, and it's about this lady named Joy Mangano. Jennifer Lawrence is Joy. Oh, Robert, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that movie. It's a great movie, but the book is even better. Yeah. But Hollywood did a pretty good job. And what I tell people, watch this movie because it shows how she had resilience and resourcefulness. Otherwise, she would have failed miserably and had to wind up serving tables or something. Yeah. But she did have that, and that is what got her over. And that is something that we all can have because we know that if we take it too personal, then it's going to really set us back. Yeah. And that's where the resiliency is. Yeah. It's just like in sports. You say, oh, the referee hates me. I can't win this game because the referee hates me. No, forget that. Play your game. And, you and I, the play the game and put game into it. And I think that's that's one of the, the things I talk about as a coach. You that's know, a good point. like when you uh, when I was doing sales, I knew it was gonna be door knocking, right? No, 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 yes. So okay, ten no's, all right, next one's a yes. Ten yep. no's, next one's a yes. I know it. And and you're putting game and, and make it fun for yourself because yeah, you can get depressed and get down. Nobody likes to hear no, no, no. But you go, right. eh, I get I get nine no's and the tenth is a yes. So that's cool. You know, there you get go. you start to understand. But you know, the personality, I am very you asked me how I got to become an entrepreneur. I had a dad, I have a wonderful father who from a little, little girl said, you can do or be anything you want in life. That's great. You know what? He set me up. He set me up for life. And I never knew. I have a brother who's a doctor, a lawyer, an architect. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I wanted to be everything. Mm. I had a nickname. Yeah. It was I wanna. <laughs> I want to be this. I, want, I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to be, you know, a jockey. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. I tried everything. I tried a private investigator. I tried everything. You know, some things stick, some things don't. I like change. So without change, and that's the other thing, with it, as an entrepreneur, you have to kind of like change. Um, you know, I, I don't want things to be the status quo. I don't like it. I, I like to have things, you know, reinvent myself every few years. So that's, if you find that fun and exciting, then you probably like entrepreneurship. <laughs> you and I must be cousins somewhere because I, think so. I was a banker for 10 years. I was in coaching. I was in sales. And now I'm in education. There's a guy named Daniel Pink. He wrote a book called A Whole New Mind. And he called him a boundary crosser. Yeah. You're probably a boundary crosser because you've had success in different careers. Yeah. Yeah. And when I left B of A after 10 years, people said, there's no life after B of A. I said, watch me. And I proved them that it is, and I'm having a ball. I left a lot of money on the table at Farmers Insurance in the late 90s to coach and teach full time. Yeah. It was the best decision I ever made because I got a chance to follow my passion as opposed to do this 70 hour a week job that I was going to become a district manager. And I saw the district manager who I was going to replace. And I realized I didn't want his life. He had no hair. Well, <laughs> no kidding. hair, I'm no kidding. fun. <laughs> yeah. A lot of stress. Yeah. A lot of stress. I thought him like crazy and the agents and all this. I said, wow. And I get a chance now to coach entrepreneurs. I get a chance to teach, and every day I can't wait until it's time to get up. You know what Something I find really exciting about them is is showing them 
the skills that they have and how you can transfer those skills into business. I find that so fun because they yeah. think, oh, I, I don't have anything. I don't know any, you know, what do I have? I'm just a mom or I'm just a this. Uh, mom, you've got time management skills. You've got, you know, all Multi kinds of skills. Yeah, yeah, multitasker and, and this and that. It, it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to help those people do that. Um, yes. Let's talk about the Institute. I really love the website. I'd like okay. to help in any capacity because I, I got excited when I saw it, if you have a, a place for me. But um, let's talk about that, what you hope to, hope to get from that and what you hope people will, will gain from it. So I'm glad you asked that. Um, back in July, I was on U.S. News and World Report, and I saw $1.6 trillion student debt. Wow. That is the number in the United States. And it got me thinking. And then I went to, in the same uh, U.S. News World Report, there was an article, 15 universities have tuition-free uh, setups. I said, wow. And then our five military academies, West Point, Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, Merchant Marine, Coast Guard, all tuition-free, paid for by the government, and we're turning out military leaders. And then I started thinking, hmm, why couldn't we have tuition-free education for black and brown entrepreneurs. Yeah. And then I said, wow, I wrote the book and I started this in March of 2019 and I had no idea of the Polk Institute. So the fact that the book was published a couple of days ago and the Polk Institute is gonna launch next month is purely coincidental. I'm not that smart to sit back and say, okay, we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do that. So I looked at it and I said, if we can do it for military leaders, why can't we do it for entrepreneurial leaders? So I ran an incubator in Torrance, a private, small, um, one unit incubator, did that for two years. Then my university president, Dominguez Hills, wanted an incubator. I got on a task force. They appointed me as the first executive director and we put it together and we had a great run, but unfortunately he retired. Mm. The new president came in and we went from maybe a top five priority to priority number 12. Yeah. I am way too old to play politics. Yeah. So I went back to doing what I love. I went back to the classroom. I went to an SBDC called PCR and I started advising clients on an individual level, entrepreneurs. And then COVID-19 hit. COVID-19, now we have Zoom. Yep. Now we have uh, people who need help and you can communicate them no matter where they are. And so because I was a banker, I helped the SBA with the PPP and the IDLE, payroll protection and the economic injury disaster loans. And then people say, well, Gary, can you help me out on the one-on-one -on -one basis as an advisor? Yes. And so technology kind of came into play. And then there's a lot of bad things about COVID-19. I said, well, what can be good out of COVID-19? Let's create the Polk Institute. Yeah. Let's set up a tuition-free scenario where people can learn black and brown entrepreneurship, but I got to do it different than what I did before. So when I was at the SBEC, South Bay Entrepreneurial Center in Torrance, and the Innovation Incubator, we put them in an incubator, and then we offered education secondarily. It didn't work as well as I wanted because some people passed on the education. Mm. So the Polk Institute was different. We're going to give them 40 weeks of education, yeah. 10 classes, four weeks at a time, one class, four weeks, and we're going to educate them. So to come in, you have to make an application, do a five-minute pitch, and submit a business plan. So you got to be thinking entrepreneurial. And then we have an interview, and we want to know, are you coachable? If you're not coachable, we don't want to work with you. Our plan is to have 25 black and brown cohorts start in January, but we're not going to be exclusive. My ideal class, 10 black, 10 brown founders, and five non-black or brown founder. I would love that. I love diversity. But we put them through this, and that's phase one. Phase two, once we graduate them, we're going to put them in an accelerator for six months mm -hmm. and then show them how to launch their business and put a mentor. So we phase one is education driven by practitioners. You could come in and teach a class on positivity. You could teach a class on something that you know well, because I would think that you as a practitioner 
could be able to relate to entrepreneurs better than a PhD that's teaching concept, getting ready for an employee. You see what I mean? Yeah. Most yeah. Employ uh, professors talk to their students like they're going to be employees. We want to talk to them like you're going to be a business owner. You're going to be a leader. Yeah. So phase two is the accelerator. And then phase three is where we want to try to give them access to capital through partner banks, through what they call CDFIs for access to capital. That's awesome. So there's a three phase program that nobody else is doing. And once they graduate, then we're going to set up a CEO group because we know it's lonely at the top. Yeah. And even though they graduate now they've launched their business, we want to give them that support network that peer CEOs can do. So our vision is very ambitious. We want to launch 1,000 ships in the next 10 years. I love it. By 2032, we want to launch 1,000 ships. That's awesome. And let's say 70% fail. Possible, very possible. But what if 300 make it and 300 creates 10 jobs each or 20 jobs each? Now we have 300 companies that can create legacies. And this is something that I think is missing in the black and brown community. I'm not talking about passing on a company that does $500, 500,000 a year. I'm yeah. talking about a company that does five or 10 million a year. But you gotta have that mindset. And this is what's exciting to me is that I have about 10 people on my founding team that have agreed to provide sweat equity. Nice. Which means volunteer. So we can launch in our first year, we're gonna pay our uh, practitioner adjunct professors, we're gonna pay our mentors, but everyone else is working for free. We're a nonprofit. What we wanna do, we have an operating budget that says it's a million dollars because we need to pay people eventually. Yeah. Our real challenge, and this is where I need a lot of help, we're trying to raise a $100 million endowment fund so that endowment can make investments and we live off of $2 million a year from the endowments and now we have a sustainable business model. And I always tell non nonprofits, don't think like a nonprofit. Think yeah. like a for-profit and what is your business model? So some people say, well, Gary, $100 million is a lot. But when I look at Babson College, they have a $479 billion, $1 million endowment. USC right here local to me, 5.7 billion for the university, 600 million for the Marshall School of Business. And then uh, Howard University, a uh, historically black university, they have a $600 million endowment. And so we're gonna go to individual donors, mm -hmm. we're gonna go to corporations, we're gonna go to the government to raise this $100 million endowment fund. And then we can truly get to 1,000 businesses in the next 10 years, but we need help. I love it. It always is about the money. Yeah, well, it's always about the money, unfortunately. But see, my dad, aside from telling me, and I, this, is, this is a book I wrote about him, aside from telling me that I can do anything I want, mm -hmm. he said, anybody can do it with money. What can you do without it? Yes, yes. And that, for me, sparked all the creativity. Like, it's yes. just like, okay, yeah, you're right. You know what? what? How can I get that without money? Or how can I do this without money? It's so great. And I think everybody should think that way. Because it really, you know, Edward de Bono, the father of creativity, like, everybody should be able to create. And you have to be able to create if you're an entrepreneur. It's not just business, you know. You got to think and, and be creative. And how are you going to, you know, set yourself aside or, or set yourself apart from other people? And, and just, that's the fun part for me. For me, I like to birth companies. Mm -hmm. I don't like to run companies. Yes. I've met I, people like you before. You <laughs> probably consider a serial entrepreneur. Yeah, I am. <laughs> that's very common. And you know, the thing is that you know who you are. Yeah. See, that's the yeah. important thing. I know what I like. Yeah. You know, I'm not a money person. Don't give me the money. <laughs> see, I think that a business owner, and people say, well, Gary, what advice would you give a new entrepreneur? Follow your passion. Yeah. If you love what you're doing, the challenge is how can we monetize it and make money? Exactly. But if you do it only for the money, because it's a beat up sport. Yep. If you're doing your passion and you get punched in the mouth, you say, whoop, that's all you got? It takes more than that to get me out. Yep. But if you're only doing it for money and you get punched in the mouth, you might say, I quit. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. Yep. So if you do it, and like you said, it's not for everybody. 
It should be your passion. You should realize that it's more than a notion. You should realize that it's a team sport and you can do it. Yeah. You might fail. You might hit some speed bumps, but speed bumps just slow us down. Dennis Waitley said failure is not the undertaker. There you go. Failure is not your undertaker. Quotes about failure. So yeah. in my book, every chapter, we start with a failure quote. Yeah. But they're always a positive quote. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, when I work with my university marketing department, and I say one of our values is failure, my uh, marketing said, they gave me a brochure and said, determine. I called her and said, Amy, determine? What are you talking about? What happened to failure? Oh, Gary, we know. We're just trying to help you out. You know, failure's kind of a negative where I said, I meant that. Yeah. I meant yeah. a statement. But if you look, it says failure, grow, and succeed from failure. Right. Yeah. So you need to learn from, from your failures. And, and failures really are the, you know, the stepping stone to, to success. Absolutely. You know, in, in Europe, you can go to university for free. And you should be able to have free education, I think, wherever you go, especially if this is the next generation. People shouldn't be held back for money. Like, it really irritates me so much that, you know, because you don't have money, you can't do this or you can't do that, especially education, because I think, but you know what? Today, the kids can go on YouTube and learn anything. I, I, I know, you know, some of my kids, they get on there and they go, oh, how did you, you can put an engine back together now? Oh, Okay. <laughs> I went on YouTube for two hours, mom, you know, whatever. I'm like, okay, that's cool. But you, you really can't. I mean, you have to be somebody who can self-motivate. If you can't, then you're not going to be any good at this at all. That's right. And that's why we teach as a leader, you have to be humble, hungry, and smart. And when we say smart, we call it EQ, emotional intelligence, intelligence not yeah. IQ. Yeah. The best CEO is going to have a high EQ that they can bring in a CMO smarter than them mm -hmm. and a CTO uh, and a CFO and a COO and realize they don't have to be the smartest at the company to be very successful. And you think about Nike. Is Phil Knight the smartest guy at Nike? No. Is Mark Zuckerberg the smartest guy at Facebook? No. As smart as Elon Musk is, is he the smartest guy at uh, SpaceX? No. Because if you're going to build an amazing company, you have to have room for amazing people to work with you. I have an so, idea for you and, and, and I'm not going to stay on air. So remind me when we go off to mention it to you. <laughs> okay. I think, is there anything, how do people get in touch with you and, and who do you want to get in touch with you? I want any entrepreneur who has a dream of having a business to get in touch with me. If you're black and brown, that's a check mark. But if you're not, that's a check mark too, because it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I teach everybody. Yeah. But you got to be coachable. If you can't, if you're not coachable. So I have a website and I'm at uh, gpoke at poke-isc.com. And that's how you reach me. And that's how you reach in your book. As I say, as I stated, when we first uh, started at the top of the show, why black and brown entrepreneurs fail and then to win. And that just was launched on Monday. So let's help get it to number one, everybody. Let's get out there and buy that book. Yeah, let's have fun. And I want to let you know that I'm on a board of directors with the Compton Youth Build, and half the proceeds of the first year will go to my nonprofit charity that I'm on the board of directors that's to. That's awesome. I think that's important. I did want to correct you earlier, our website. Yeah. Our website is actually poke-isc.com. You said .org. Oh, that's what I had. Sorry. Yeah, Somebody said that, that to me. We have to make your marketing. Team. We're going to get it directed, but to re today it should be poke-isc.com. Dot .com. Okay. And I will that's repost correct. that, folks, on the, web, on, the, on the Good Radio Network website. Gary, thank you so much for being my guest today. Stick around. Facebook Live, goodbye. Thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Please like down below. Give us a whirly smile face because that helps make us go wide and far uh, across Facebook. I love you and I'll see you again next week. Take care. All right, let me stop the recording.